want to send a greeting um, from all of the leadership, everyone here at Court Church, to everyone online, everyone in the house. Um, you're all very welcome. I just want to start service tonight um, by encouraging you guys around Jesus, around the, our Savior, our King. And, you know, I started a job recently at Leia Healthcare, and my manager has started to give me targets just in the last week. You know, you must hit a certain amount of interactions, a certain amount of retentions, and different things like that. And on the top of my computer screen, there's a little tab that says performance. And within that tab, I can see everything that I've done, everything that I've hit or I haven't hit. And I started to realize in the last couple of days, I've, I've become really obsessive about what I'm hitting, what I'm not hitting, and how I'm doing all of the time. And I realized that in life, we can become a lot like that. We can obsess of, over how we're doing all of the time. What am I doing? How am I doing? Am I achieving? Am I successful? And I just think we need to take a moment to stop tonight and pause. And instead of thinking, how are we doing? We need to think of what has he done? We need to think of what has Jesus done for us. It's time to stop looking at our performance and start looking at his performance. And let's look at Isaiah 53 just before we get into worship tonight. 53 verses 5 to 6 that says, But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. I love that. It's all the emphasis lies on Christ tonight. Instead of us looking at ourselves here with our heads down, hanging in shame, we look to Jesus for our victory, for our life, for our hope. Again, that is a fresh, that is a new each and every day. His mercies are new and his mercies are fresh. Um, so I just want to encourage you to that, that the Israelites looked and lived in the wilderness. The thief on the cross, Pastor Nick shared it a couple of weeks ago, looked and lived. And I want to encourage you tonight, don't look at your performance. Look at Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith, the initiator and the one who will bring it to completion against that day. Let's worship him, look and live to our Savior, Jesus. Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you for your mercies that are new every day. Thank you that it's by your stripes we are healed. It's not the work of our hands, but it's the work of your hands, Jesus, Lord. As they were pierced on the cross so that we could be healed, that we could be set free. And that's what we are. We are indeed free people tonight. So as free children, we worship you, our King, our Savior, our friend. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. You reign, you reign, O Lord. Over all the earth. to the King of Kings. Lord, reign in me. Lord, reign in me. Reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? Oh, we bless you, Jesus, over every thought.
bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Oh, we bless you, Jesus. We declare that you are the old the overcomer. Lift our hands as we sing this, please. To worship you, oh God. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. Lord of Lords, Lord of Lords, Prince of Peace, Prince of Peace.
Thank you, oh God. Lord, that one day, Lord, we will stand, oh Lord, in a different place, oh God. And we will join, Lord, with the congregation of heaven, Lord. We will join with the angels, Lord. Lord, and we will sing that, Lord. Lord, worthy is the Lamb, worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Oh Lord, worthy, oh God, Lord. Oh Lord, we join, Lord, Lord, now, Lord, with heaven, oh God. Lord, and we say, Lord, you are worthy, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy to, worthy to receive honor, oh Lord, and glory, Lord. Oh Lord, adoration, oh God, worship, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord, hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Oh God, Lord, thank you, oh God. Thank you, oh God, for bringing us right in, oh God. Oh, Lord, our future, Lord. Lord, our future is secure in you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we're going to heaven, Lord. And I thank you, oh God. You brought us, Lord, translated us, Lord. Lord, from darkness, Lord. Lord, to light, oh God. Lord, from death, Lord. Lord, to life, oh God. Oh, Lord, from sin, oh God. Oh, Lord, to justification, Lord, and, and righteousness, oh God. Oh, Lord, Lord, from hell, Lord. Lord, to heaven, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. Good to be together. Good to worship tonight. Before you sit down, shake somebody's hand. Greet one another. Find out a name if you don't know a name. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, it's, it's lovely to be together tonight, and uh, welcome to all of you uh, who have come into service tonight. Um, is there anybody here for the first time? I've got a couple of special guests I'll introduce in a moment, um, but anybody else here for the first for the first time? Give me a wave. Any any guests amongst us, or anybody just ventured in for the first time? No. Well, we have uh, Phil Phil Bird and Sarah Bird. Uh, are here with us. We, Phil is up in the studio, so we've asked them to come in and help with our, our tech issues. Uh, but Sarah is here. Sarah, we'll, 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 we'll call her the brains behind the operation. Sarah, would you, would you stand up and allow us to welcome you? Can we welcome Sarah and, and Phil tonight? They are long-term friends. Um, if you've ever been to a Summer Fire Conference, Youth Weekend, Young Adult Event, uh, they come in and they help us with all the complicated stuff, the screens and the sound and the lights, and they have made so much ministry possible by just giving of their skills and their time. They are missionaries, that they live full-time for the Lord, and they serve in, in whatever capacity they can, and they've been so kind to us, and we're so thankful for you, Sarah, releasing Phil so many times to come and drive across here and, and move equipment, set it up, and, and run cameras and all sorts of things. So we're so grateful to have you and so lovely to have you with us. Can we clap for them one more time? They're such good friends. <laughs> Praise God. Well, if you need an envelope tonight for uh, given, if you're, if you're wanting to give cash tonight, uh, the ushers will serve you with an envelope. And we also have a card machine out in the red carpet area if, if you prefer to give using card when we take our offering in a few moments. And just while the, the ushers are helping with that, I've got a couple of special announcements. 
Uh, first of all, this Sunday we have our Filipino service, so looking forward to that. I'll be at that myself. Always enjoy the food there, so excited about that. Our Filipino service this Sunday after the church service at 1.30 p.m. And then also, would you please remember our youth team out in, out in the wilds of Switzerland um, as they serve there. That camp is starting today. That youth camp that they're serving at and ministering at, uh, that's starting today. So keep them in prayer. You know, for young people to go out and serve like this, um, they have, and I've said this before, they have uh, the enemy on their shoulder condemning them like we all do. And there's every reason for them not to serve uh, according to the enemy, but, there's, but they have listened to the greater voice, which is the voice of the Holy Spirit, which says, go and serve, go and, and be a blessing. And so they're out there serving, and I'm so proud of them, uh, but we need to keep them in prayer, brothers and sisters. And actually what we might do is we'll pray for our offering now, and we'll pray for our team. Actually, Ben, would you come up? And just, just pray for our team and, and pray for our offering tonight. I think that would be appropriate. Thank you, Lord. Father, we want to thank you tonight because uh, you are just, you're worth thanking for so much, Lord. Uh, so much you've given us, so much you've done uh, for us, Lord God. Least of all, uh, dying in our place, Lord God. What a, what a God we serve. Um, we're so, I'm grateful that you're still at work here in this generation right now uh, in our midst, Lord. Thank you that you are working here in Cork, but also uh, the same God that's here is in Geneva working, Lord, through our young people. Lord, thank you that you have qualified us to be used uh, by you and that we can say yes Lord thank you for the uh, zeal that, that caused these young people to say yes thank you for the team Lord for Tiwa for Tasha for Shannon Lord God uh, for Jordan and Chelsea Lord pastor in that youth ministry there I pray a blessing on them I pray that you would keep them now and Lord and let your let your spirit work in miraculous ways Lord God not that we would be surprised because you're so good but surprise us Lord with the testimonies that we hear uh, Lord and we pray for this offering thank you for blessing us in such abundance Lord uh, and I thank you that we get to be part of a house that is that is eager to see the things of God advance in this city Lord so would you do that with our finances would you uh, would you cause them to, to see your kingdom go further to, to reach to the the darkest parts of this this city Lord that uh, the light of the gospel would shine for all men to see uh, we give you glory in advance for what you've already you're doing and what you've already done uh, and we love you tonight in Jesus name amen Thank you, Ben. Just uh, ushers, if you would uh, proceed with the, the offering. Uh, a couple of other announcements then, just to keep everybody on the straight and narrow. Tomorrow we have our lunch hour prayer at 12.30 as normal, an interactive prayer meeting via Facebook. And then tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. we have our Portuguese speaker service and fellowship time. The service is up here in the sanctuary. Now they've outgrown downstairs. It's very exciting. Uh, lovely things happening on Thursday evenings here. Uh, youth will be on Friday evening at 7 p.m. as normal here in the church. And then Sunday morning, uh, Sunday morning starts with a prayer meeting at 10 a.m. Uh, downstairs. And then our main service is at 11 a.m. And then, of course, like I already announced, the Filipino service is at 1.30 p.m. just after lunch. Uh, Sunday evening, then we have a young adult service here at 7 p.m. And then Monday evening prayer starts at 7 p.m. on Zoom, an interactive online uh, prayer meeting. So that is our announcements. Praise God. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm looking forward to getting into the Word of God uh, with one of my uh, favorite preachers, Pastor Patrick. God is using you, brother, you know, to, to speak to us. And I'm so thankful for the way he is using you. You've, you've been a blessing to my life and, and to my family. I think we can all agree on that. So can, can we encourage Pastor Patrick and just welcome him as he comes tonight? Thank you. That was really kind, Pastor Stephen. Thank you. Can't I just, you know... That touched me coming up there. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Stephen. Um, guys, it's good to be with you tonight. Let's pray and we'll get into the word. Lord, thank you so much for your presence in this place. 
Thank you so much that you've called us, Lord, and what a wonderful calling that is, Lord, out of darkness into your marvelous light, Lord, uh, out from outside of the promises, right into the very, Lord, center of all promise, your son, Jesus. What an amazing thing tonight, Lord, and, and I just pray that in my imperfection and weakness and humanity, you can use me to bring the word to your people, your beloved bride, Lord, the people you died for, the people you shed your precious blood for. So just help me, Lord, and uh, just, be, just be with us in this time. I really just pray for grace, Lord, as we get into the Scriptures. So thank you so much for your presence and for your power uh, and for the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Well, church, it's good to be with you tonight. Uh, I have a long title for you again Try not to act surprised. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, tonight. That, well, the title of the message is Beyond a Dolan. Beyond a Dolan, open brackets, safe spaces, strongholds, and songs. Safe spaces, strongholds, and songs. So if you'll turn with me to 1 Samuel 22, we're going to just read uh, from the text here and then we're going to dive in. 1 Samuel 22. Okay, let's go. David departed from there and escaped. Say escape with me tonight. To the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and his father's house heard it, they went down there to them. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became a commander over them. And there were with him about four hundred men. Verse 3, and David went from there to Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, please let my father and mother stay with you till I know what God will do for me. And he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Verse 5, then the prophet Gad said to David, do not remain in the stronghold depart and go to the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. Amen. We'll uh, end the reading there. Let me give you a little bit of background, guys, as we dive in tonight. David is seeking refuge. Amen. So he's gone through a lot. I mean, we're all familiar enough with the story of David. He's gone through a lot. He's had his meteoric rise to fame. Uh, he's gone through a marriage He's had danger from Philistines, and he's had repeated attempts on his life, uh, along with being forced to say goodbye to his family, to everybody that he loves, uh, to his brother-in-arms, Jonathan, and live his life out as a fugitive, or a fugitive, I should really pronounce that properly, amen, at the beginning, amen. Well, let me say this to you tonight, guys, life can be unpredictable. Life can be unpredictable, Amen. Life can weigh you down. And that's exactly what was going on here with David. Folks, no place was safe for this man. I want you to really get into the story here. He couldn't go to his house. He couldn't go to the palace. He couldn't see Samuel the prophet. He couldn't see Jonathan, his brother. He couldn't even go to the house of the Lord. He couldn't go to church. He couldn't even go to the ungodly. And it even began to, uh, to uh, affect him spiritually. It started to do something to David's spiritual life. And for a time, David even backslid. The Bible tells us that he went out and uh, lived uh, in Gath as a madman. Uh, he pretended to be a madman anyway. And it's funny, folks, uh, in our low moments, even the best of us are only a step away from madness. It's true, isn't it? Only a few steps away from madness. But this is David's story. And finally, David retreats to a cave called Adullam. Now, Adullam's interesting. It's got two meanings. First one is refuge, but the second is justice for the people. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? And, and where Adullam was faced, that's also interesting. Where it was placed, uh, from the mouth of Adullam, he could see Gath. He could see where God had given him victory over Goliath with a sling. He could see it. And now... He needed the sword of Goliath to protect himself from Saul. Well, what an interesting thing. I think we're, we're all familiar with that feeling 
that our best days are behind us. Maybe that's what David felt in that cave in Adullam. He could see better days. He could see victorious days. He could see his past clearly, but he couldn't see his future. And the Bible says those who were discontented, those who were embittered and distressed, followed him there. And David waited there to see what God would do for him. Let me ask you tonight, where do you retreat to? Where do you retreat to when no place feels safe? There are good kinds of retreats and there are bad kinds of retreats. Amen? We love the good kind of retreat. We love to get away with our family. We love to go on holiday. Me and the family are going back to Center Parks in May. That's a good kind of retreat. I like that kind of retreat. But when I get hurt by people and I don't feel like I can open my heart again and conduct myself in a gospel-centered way in relationships and I withdraw and hide myself, that's a bad kind of retreat. Amen? And let's be honest tonight. We can call it what we want. Where we have conceded, where we have drawn back from what used to be the line, we're in retreat. Now, you might be there in body. You might still show up. You might still see that person go to that place. But maybe there's less effort. Maybe there's less passion. Maybe you're doing the same thing, but you're doing it with a closed heart. If that's you tonight, I want to say in love, you may be in retreat. You may be conducting yourself in the same relationships, but you're not putting yourself out there anymore because you don't want to be hurt. If that's you tonight, it's retreat. And it's interesting, we live in a culture of safe spaces, don't we? That's the word of the day. That's the, the MO of today's society. Safe spaces. Safe spaces are defined as, uh, as places that are intended to be free of bias, conflict, criticism, or potentially threatening actions, ideas, or conversations. So nowhere on planet Earth then. Amen? Nowhere at all. Uh, you know, we can, be, we, can, we can take a very convenient stance when we look at some of the uh, uh, delicate snowflake lefties and they're petitioning for uh, safe spaces and all that kind of thing. But let me put it to you, church. It doesn't have to be a designated room on a campus. It can be a mentality. It can be a narrative. Maybe we're a little too quick to judge the left and their embracing of safe spaces. Maybe we need to look again at our own. Maybe we have created safe spaces in our lives. I believe today that the Holy Spirit would say this to us as a church. You can't stay here in your safe space, living in retreat. There is a call tonight for us to go beyond a dolem. We need to be saved from our safe spaces. Why? Because they become strongholds. Safe spaces become strongholds. What we initially flee to to keep something out becomes the very thing that keeps us trapped inside, keeps us in mentalities, narratives, arguments. Make no mistake tonight, church, that safe space is a grave. It is a grave. And uh, graves are quiet. Graves are trouble-free, comfortable places. Amen. Dead people are safe from offense. They're safe from bitterness. They don't have to deal with people hurt. They don't have to deal with problem bosses. They don't have to deal with spouses and children that are wayward. And some of us in our attempt to hide from what we have to face, we have buried ourselves alive. We've buried ourselves alive. We've, we've chosen to be frozen rather than fruitful. We'd rather be paralyzed than, than progress into our purpose. This is the issue. This is the, the, the problem that we can face when we retreat. But hallelujah tonight, if that is you, you are not alone. Hallelujah. Psalm 1398 says this, if I go up to heaven, you are there. And if I go down into the grave, you are there. Hallelujah. Folks, graves are God's specialty. 
Hallelujah tonight. The Bible says they found, they went in seeking justice and they found a commander and a captain and a king. Praise the Lord tonight. So I want to look at three things tonight, hopefully quickly. The first is I want to look at the crowd in the cave. I want to look at the reasons why we retreat. And then I want to look at the cry in the cave. I want to look at the root and the response to our retreating. And then finally, I want to look at the Christ in the cave. I want to look at the revelation and the rally in retreat. Amen? Let's do this. So let's start with the crowd in the cave, the reasons for retreat. Uh, the Bible says in the first few verses of uh, 1 Samuel 22, David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went there to him. And it goes on and it gives us three Ds. Three types of people who escaped into the cave with David. Three types of people, 400 men, three Ds. The first is distressed. Those who were distressed. And let me say this to you. When you look at that word distress, it means pain. It means genuine pain. And actually the word is best rendered as a narrow place. So their pain had trapped them in a narrow place. And you know, folks, pain has that ability to trap us in the now. Some of us, if we're honest, we can find ourselves trapped by an experience, an event, an abuse, a trauma. And pain can become a prison. Pain, you see, will redirect your focus. Just pinch yourself. Pain will redirect your focus. Pain has the power to hold you in the moment, even if that moment was 20 years ago. I'll just quote this from a study I read. When an individual is traumatized, especially, on in early, especially early on in life, the memory of the trauma is stored both in the brain and the body. In essence, depending on the severity of the trauma, your entire way of being may be formed around the traumatic incident. Folks, that's amazing. That's eye-opening. That, that might be revelatory for some of you in this place. My goodness, could the trauma I have faced, the pain I have gone through, could it have formed and shaped mentalities, ideas, outlooks, motives, and practices in my life. Folks, let me say this to you. We're supposed to pass through pain. Pain is an inevitability. We're supposed to pass through it, but we're not supposed to make our home there. And can I, can I, can I just talk candidly? Can I, can, I, can I just speak candidly in love? Because this is a hard truth. Some people build their identity around their trauma as well. They do. Because sometimes it is easier to be a victim. That's a tough truth. That's a hard pill to swallow. But it is true. It's easier to be a victim than to move beyond your pain and live as a victor. Because no one puts much expectation on you when you have been through something. And let me say this in love, but in truth, for some of you, your pain has become your excuse. Your pain has become your excuse. Don't, don't ask much of me. Expect too much from me. I've been through things. Folks, life is dangerous. It is, and it's unfair. We don't all get the same starting line we don't all start from the same place. Some of us have had to deal with pain early on, on, and some of us have stumbled over pain along the way. Life is unfair, but it still has to be lived. The race still has to be run. And I believe the Holy Spirit is here tonight to help us to let go because we can't hide in pain all of our lives. We serve a God who turns trauma into testimony. He turns trauma into testimony. He turns graves into gardens. He takes hopeless things, broken things. He, he takes our ashes and gives us beauty. Hallelujah. He takes the sorrows in life 
and gives us a garment of praise. We don't have to hide in pain. The second D is those who owed, those who were in debt. And you know, folks, there's more than one type of debt. And creditors make many forms or take many forms. Let me put it to you this way. The worse your choices in life, the more creditors you accrue. You know, in Deuteronomy, it talks about the the curse, the the, the uh, blessings and curses. Um, you know, Moses in, uh, institutes them uh, to the children of Israel, and one of them is this: that if they obeyed, if the children of Israel obeyed, they would never be the borrower, but always be the lender. And conversely, if they disobeyed, they would always borrow, but never lend. They would be the tail and not the head. You see, your decisions in life can cause you to accrue creditors. But I, I want to say this to you tonight. Just because you failed, just because you have made poor choices and let people down, doesn't mean you shouldn't try again. Amen? Past failures, mistakes with people, hurts, pain you have caused, inflicted on others. You may owe a lot of people tonight. You may owe them your apology. You may owe them your time. Maybe you owe your spouse. Maybe you owe your children. You didn't give them, you, you weren't there for them. But just because you weren't there for them in the past doesn't mean you can't be there for them now. It doesn't mean that. Listen to me tonight. Don't spend your life in regret, hiding in regret when there is still time on the clock. Amen. God has not called time on the story. There is a word in the Bible called restitution. It means the act of putting it right. Think of Zacchaeus, Luke chapter 19, a man who had up to the point that he had met Jesus, spent his life accruing creditors. But when he encountered Christ, the grace of the gospel, the love of the gospel, the forgiveness of the gospel, something stirred in him. And he said, there's still time on the clock. I am going to give four times what I defrauded. I will live the rest of my days pursuing restitution. It may not be perfect, but God is with you in it. What was Christ's response to a man who'd done only what he could to build up and, and get creditors. Truly salvation has come to this house. In other words, Zacchaeus, I'm on board with your pursuit of restoration. There's still time on the clock. And get an amen if, you're, if, you, if, you want to, if, if, if it's good news for you tonight. The last D was, is, is this. Um... Do you know what? My translation actually doesn't say it, but it is the discontent. Thanks, guys. I've got one of those newfangled translations. It set me up for a fall, but it's discontentment. Thanks, guys. I love crowd participation. We'll get there together. We'll do it together. Some translations, including the one in front of me, <laughs> say, say those who are bitter in soul. That's the last D. Those with uh, discontent. Those with unresolved offenses. Folks, you know, relationships aren't safe. You don't need a preacher to tell you that. But if you're going to love and live with an open heart, you're going to get hurt. We know that, but we don't, we, we don't want to hear it. And for those who are bitter in soul, they're a dullum. You're a dullum tonight. might be unforgiveness. It might be. You know, unforgiveness can be a safe space. It's safer than the vulnerability of letting that person in because they may not change. Some of you might be sitting here tonight saying, I will not let that person back in again because I will not be hurt that way again. And I'm not trying to excuse unforgiveness tonight, but maybe we must misunderstand it. You see, unforgiveness is a defensive strategy. That's what it is. Maybe you're asking, why does that person have such an issue letting go of things? 
I've apologized and apologized, but they just can't let it go. Have you ever considered that they may not feel safe around you? It's one of the easiest things that we can do. We can get frustrated when we we see unforgiveness in others. Yes, it's about pride, but it's also about self-protection. And for that person, if you're that person, if you're dealing with unforgiveness and you are hiding, you, you are hiding in unforgiveness, asking questions like, what if they do it again, Lord? Maybe waiting for God to give you justice and deal with them. I'm not coming out until something changes, until something breaks, until they, you do something in their character. Well, today I want to let you know something. Forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. It's time to let go. We can't hide in unforgiveness. We can't spend our lives waiting for God to enact some sort of justice on the person. Some of us would rather God deal with them and until he does, we don't want to deal with our unforgiveness. I want to encourage you tonight to seek justice vertically. Because bitterness is what happens when we seek it horizontally, when we bring our case to people instead of God. Three Ds, three people who came and met David in the cave. You know, I want to keep going here. I'm conscious of time. I think it's going to take a a miracle for me to finish this tonight, but that's okay. I want to look at the cry in the cave. Because more happened, something happened in that place. I want to look today, not just at the reasons why we can retreat, but I want to look at the root of and the response to retreat. You know, David, the Bible says in verse 3, he went into uh, Samuel, he went uh, from there to Mizpah of Moab. And he said to the king of Moab, please let my father and mother stay with you till I know what God will do with me. And he left them with the king of Moab and he stayed with him all the time David was at the stronghold. You know, it's interesting. David's there. The 400 men are there. And David makes a decision. You know, he took his parents to Moab because his great-grandmother was, of course, Ruth the Moabite. So he wanted his parents to be safe because he didn't know what battles he'd face in the future. So David's response, how David responds in the cave, is that he turns to family for asylum. That's what he does. His concerns for his parents were legitimate. Some of your concerns are legitimate. The problem is he brought them to the wrong place. He brought them to Moab. He brought them to Moab. Can you see it? His response was to go to Moab with his concerns, with the things that mattered most to him, with his anxieties, with his fears. Why? Because he couldn't see beyond this particular chapter he was in, in his story. The, The text says, till I know what God will do with me. David had lost confidence in God. And when you lose confidence in God, you will begin to move horizontally instead of vertically. You will look for asylum, for refuge in Moab instead of in your maker. You see, Moab is any refuge or source of strength other than God. Have you been bringing your concerns to Moab? Have you told everybody but God about it? You know, some of us are trauma. Some of what we talk about, some of the things that we bring to Moab, the conversations we have, the phone calls, the people we go to to talk about what we're going through. Some of us, we have a tough five minutes and talk about it all week long and then say we've had a tough week. That's the truth. We go to Moab. We knock on every door. We go through the yellow pages and ring everybody in Moab to tell everybody but the king what's going on in our lives. When we go, and you know, the funny thing is this. David brought his concerns, brought his parents to Moab, and then went right back to the stronghold. He went straight back to Adullam. It changed nothing. 
when we can't see what God is doing, when we can't see beyond the cave, beyond the stronghold, we bring, in, we bring our concerns and our hurts and our anxieties to people. We bring them to people. We tell people our problems. We look to people for support and for strength, but not even family can be a refuge. Not even family can give you the security, the assurance, the refuge you need. We love to make plans, strategies. We cling to justifications and narratives, but we end up back in a dolem because it is powerless. Listen to me. There is more power in the faintest cry to the King of Kings than all the appeals in the world to the King of Moab. I'll say it again. There is more power in the faintest cry to the King of Kings than all the appeals in the world to the King of Moab. Folks, we can't do this horizontally all day, every day. We have to rediscover the power in our cry to God. Psalm 142. You see, David wrote at least two, probably three Psalms in the cave. Psalm 34, Psalm 142, and Psalm 57. And Psalm 142, most commentators think, was one of the earliest psalms that David wrote in the cave of Adullam. And you know, his emotional state was probably similar to that of the 400 men. David was emotional. David was going to all the wrong places. But at a certain point, and I'll read Psalm 142 in just a second, David opened his mouth and he began to pray. Let me not go any further until I read Psalm 142. It's just seven verses. I'm only going to focus really on verses four to six, but let me read it all. With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they've hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. There is no one who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison, that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me for you will deal bountifully with me folks the power of your cry David called out at a certain point he opened his mouth and began to pray and at a certain point when you have spoken to everyone about it when you've exhausted every person who will listen when you have bent every ear when you have gotten every ounce of sympathy and feigned understanding from people and you're still in the cave because people can't save you from your stronghold. You may be brought back to that place of prayer and it is the mercy of God to us. It is the grace of God to us. David looked finally for justice, brought his cares to God because he served a God who knew his way. God who knew my way. You know, uh, Anne Graham Lotz said this, desperation compels us to pray with fervent, focused faith, especially when we have no one else to turn to. God honors our faith when we place it in him alone with no backup plan, no other recourse, no other way out. He hears and answers our desperate heart cry because he loves to show himself strong on our behalf. Hallelujah. Alexander McLaren said this, did any of you parents ever hear your child wake from sleeping with some panic, fear, and shriek the mother's name through the darkness? Was not that a more powerful appeal than all words? And depend upon it that the soul which cries aloud on God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, though it have no language, language but a cry, will never call in vain. Hallelujah tonight. It might just be a cry in the darkness. It may be the shortest and most ineloquent prayer, but he will hear because he is a loving father. 
He is a loving father. Job wrote so famously in 20, uh, chapter 23, verse 10, I go east, but he is not there. I go west, but I cannot find him. I do not see him north, for he is hidden. I look to the south, but he is concealed. But he knows where I'm going, even if I don't. He knows where I'm going. And when he tests me, I will come out as pure as gold. And some of us, we know what it is to walk to every corner of that cave. You've been there long enough. You know every inch of that cave. And you can't see beyond it. And you can't discern his presence. And all you feel like is that your best days are behind you. And you might not be able to see him today, but you are seen by him. Amen. And let me encourage you, you don't have to see when you're seen. He knows which way you're going. He knows your end from your beginning. He knows the plans and purposes he has for your life. And they're not changing. Hallelujah. We serve a God who sees the entirety of our plan. He sees all our purpose, everything. So I will tell him everything. Don't wait to pray. Don't wait to feel it. Start where you are and bring your emotions to your Father in heaven because he loves you. In verse 4 of Psalm 57, he says, look to the right and see. There's no one who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. That was the root of David's retreat. There was no one, God, no one, he's saying it to the Lord, no one has my back. No one is on my side. I have no one in my corner. Where were all the people that David had been there for? Where were, all the, where were they? No one cares enough to ask me how I am. I feel like I don't have an advocate. Of course, that's not true. No one to fight for me. God, where is the justice? Where is the fairness? David felt abandonment. He felt exposure. And he went on to say, I've no shepherd of my soul. In other words, you, you must not care about me, Lord. And that was at the heart of David's retreat. He had lost all confidence in the character of God and God's feelings for him. David felt he had no support. He was surrounded by people, but unsupported. That's how he felt. And he goes on in verse 5. And he begins to say this. And this is David's moment of honesty. And the NLT says it so well. You are my hiding place. And all I really want in life. Sometimes you've got to spend some time in the cave to get back to that place. And then he goes on. I'm so low. That's how it's rendered here in the NLT. Rescue me from them. They're too strong for me. That's where David went. That was his prayer. But you know, folks, it's amazing. When you turn to Psalm 57, written later in the cave, you see a shift. Because something happens in the place of prayer. Amen? David goes from playing the, praying the truth of his emotions to, and, and the problem to praying the truth about his God. You know, I'll read it in just a second here. But this shift is amazing. He goes from praying his trouble, his problems, his issues, to praying the truth of his God. And let me say this to you tonight. Sometimes the answer to prayer is not that it changes your circumstances. It's that it changes you. Folks, this is the point. This is the point. We start crying out. We cry out from whatever place we're at. We tell God our emotions, but it doesn't stay there. And it didn't stay there for David. David, things start to turn around. Let me quickly read Psalm 57 here. Some of it, just a portion of it to you tonight. Because it doesn't stay in that place of venting. God's okay with us venting. But when you vent in his presence, it doesn't stay there. He goes on and he begins to talk about this. In verse 2, look at this. 
or verse 1, be, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in your soul, for in you my soul takes refuge, in the shadow of your wings I take refuge, till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his faith, steadfast love and faithfulness. And down in verse 7, he says this, my heart is steadfast or confident, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. What a transition. What a shift. Do you know, there's nothing wrong with asking God to change your circumstances. But his primary objective is to change you. It's what it is. The circumstances you're asking God to change may be the very circumstances he's using to change you. Some amazing quotes here by Mark Patterson. Something happened in prayer. God restored his confidence. It started with complaints, but it didn't stay there. It started with David being in his feelings, but it ended with David in a place of faith. It's amazing. What an amazing truth tonight that when we call out in that cave, God will meet us and in our, in, in our inability to, to hold to confidence in who he is, he can bring us all the way through to a steadfast confidence in who he is. Look at what he says. Lord, he says, in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until the storms of destruction pass by. In other words, he says, Lord, you and not this cave are my refuge. You are my safe space. And there's mercy for me in the shadow of your wings. There's mercy in God. You know, some translations change, the shelter, change it to the shelter of the Most High. And others say the secret place of the Most High. What it's referencing is the Holy of Holies. The, uh, the, the Holy of Holies with the two angels on either side. This is a reference to the mercy seas. This is a reference to God's atonement. It's amazing. So what he's really saying is this. There's shelter for me in my salvation. There's shelter for me in the gospel. When I return to what God has done for me at the cross, how God has purchased me, shed his blood for me, brought me back to that place, there is shelter. There is protection. There is hope in, under the shadow of his wings. It's amazing. In Jesus, I am unshakable. I am immovable. I am protected. Hallelujah. You know, Charles Spurgeon said, even as the parent bird completely shields her brood from evil and meanwhile cherishes them with the warmth of her own heart by covering them with her wings, so do thou with me, most condescending God, for I am thine offspring and thou hast a parent's love in perfection. Perfect love, the, uh, the love of a parent. David found it in God again. And he goes on, he says, God will fulfill his purpose for me. Or the translations say, vindicate me. Others say, perform, perform all things for me. The Amplified says it this way, who accomplishes all things on my behalf. For he completes my purpose in his plan. It's amazing. Psalm 138, 8 says, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Philippians 1, 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Christ Jesus. David got back to confidence, folks. The plan is still the plan. Amen? Can you say amen tonight? I never, David never had the strength to get from the pasture to the palace. Never. Folks, it's all of grace. And David got back to that reality. It's by promise, folks, not by perspiration. And if you could do it, if you could achieve it, it wouldn't be grace. Hallelujah. Do you, do you hear David's confidence lifting again? 
Do you hear, do you see the work that God is doing in his heart? You know, Oswald Chambers said it this way. When God gives you a vision and darkness follows wait, God will bring the vision he has given you to reality in your life if you wait on his timing. Never try and help God fulfill his word. Hallelujah tonight. God's got this. The plan is still the plan. Amen. He will fulfill his purposes for you. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the cave. It doesn't matter how many years you've spent in retreats. God will do what he promised to do. He doesn't need your help. Hallelujah. Verse 3, what does he say? He says, he'll send from heaven and save me. He'll put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send his steadfast love and his faithfulness. In other words, David understood and finally recognized something we all need to recognize, that we need to be saved. We need the gospel, folks. We need redeeming love. The same love that saved you from the grave, saved you from death, has to find you in your adullam. Amen. Has to bring you out. And David's confidence was restored in that place. And in finishing, very quickly, I want to look at Christ in the cave. Then the prophet, verse 5, then the prophet God said to David, do not remain in the stronghold. Hallelujah. Depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. You know, folks, Christ is the higher David. We come to Adullam with our these, seeking comfort, seeking justice, but we find something better there. We find a king, hallelujah, a captain. We find a refuge. We enter one way and we leave another. We come despondent, we come desperate, we come in need, but we leave mighty men on the way to praise. You see, Jesus is with us in our humiliation. And we are with him in his exaltation. When Jesus descended, when he came into that grave, when he came into that place of death, the death that tried to hold on to him couldn't. And not only did he rise, but he brought a people with him. This is the greater picture here, that Jesus rose from the grave, rose from Adullam, and brought a people with him because nothing could hold him, and so nothing can hold you. You can't stay here because you won't stay here. Christ has done it all. There is a call to Judah tonight in closing. Judah means praise. There was a confidence that was restored in the cave as David began to call out and bring his problems to God rather than to Moab. And in that place, God restored his confidence. It's from that place of confidence, he said, I will awake the dawn with a song. You know, we need resurrection in closing because things have died. Things have died. And maybe what we need to be resurrected is our passion. Maybe it's our capacity to forgive because we can be trapped in a dullum. We can be surrounded by all the things that have died. But he's with us in the cave and he's leaving. He's going to Judah and we're coming with him. He's here to restore your confidence He's here to do it. There is something better than justice available for you today. There's a king, there's a captain. God wants to bring you out of the safe space you've been hiding in to come and hide in the only true refuge, which is him. So I'd like to invite Pastor Nick up or Pastor Stephen just to pray and we'll close down tonight. Thank you for being so patient and sitting and, and listening. And I pray that this has been a help to you. Praise the Lord. Would we stand with me as we sing to the Lord tonight? Just make a little altar unto the Lord because I feel that God has spoken to us tonight, spoken to me, and I hope He's spoken to you tonight. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his refuge. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, just for a moment, just raise your hands to him and just call out to him from your cave. Just uh, reach out to the Lord as he is here tonight amongst us. You know, not, don't be fellowshipping with your deeds and your problems. Uh, speak them to Jesus tonight. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. I lift my hands to the coming King, to the great I am, to you I sing, for you're the one who reigns within my heart, who reigns within my heart, and I will serve the foreign God. No, any other treasure. No, nor any other, other treasure. For you are my heart's desire. For you are my heart's desire. Your spirit without measure. Your spirit without measure. Unto your name. Unto your name. I will bring my sacrifice. I will bring my sacrifice. Can we sing it again, please? I lift my hands to the coming King. I lift my hands to the coming King. To the great I am. To the great I am. To you I sing. For you're the one. For you're the one who reigns within my heart. And I will serve the foreign God. Nor any other treasure. Nor any other treasure. For you are my heart's desire. And for you are my heart's desire. Your spirit without measure. And your spirit without measure. Unto your name. Unto your name. I will bring my sacrifice. We bless you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Unto your name. Hallelujah, Lord. of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Hallelujah, Lord. I want to see you. Touch your eyes tonight. Help us to see you, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high. To see you I am lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy. To see you high and lift it up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 holy. Holy, 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 I want to see you. Holy, 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 hol
to see you high. Thank you, Jesus. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing. Holy, 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 I want to see you. We give you praise, Jesus. We give you praise, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Jesus. As the dear that has fallen, the water so my soul, my soul longs after thee. You this alone. Is our, this is our final song. Sing you it to the Lord. Raise your hands tonight. Those in line, raise your voice to the Lord tonight. And say, Lord, I want you, Lord. You're the one I desire tonight, Lord. God, open my eyes to you, Lord. The source of my strength. You alone. Strength of my life. Thank you, Lord. In you alone are my strength, my shield. And to you alone may my spirit. you more I want you more than gold or silver only you can satisfy you alone are the real joy giver and the apple of Just one more time, please. With a loud voice telling you, you praise alone, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord. And you alone are my strength, my shield. And to you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire. praise you tonight lord we thank you lord for your comfort lord for your uh, for your most kindest overtures to forsake that den and to come unto you lord to forsake that dark place and to make you our refuge lord i hear your words tonight lord uh, when you spoke in the scriptures oh my dove which art in the cleft of the rock in the secret place of the stair let me see let me hear your voice let me see your countenance I thank you tonight, Lord, that you're calling us back again, Lord, to that face-to-face encounter, Lord, with you, our only hope, our only strength, our only refuge, Lord. We want to bless you tonight, Lord. We want to thank you for meeting with us, your presence amongst us, Lord, your word that has so challenged and encouraged our hearts tonight. We thank you for it, Father. Bless us as we leave tonight. Bless our families, Lord. Keep us safe, Lord. But, Lord, keep us moving out of that cave, Lord, right towards the, the cross of Jesus, towards that mercy seat, Lord. Help us to share our problems upwards and not outwards, O oh God. And let us see, Lord, heaven fight on our behalf tonight. And God's deliverance has come, not man's. We bless you now, Lord, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord praise tonight. The oh, Lord bless you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're all very welcome tonight. You're welcome to stay for teas and coffees, downstairs fellowship. And if you're new to the church, in for the first time, come and say hello to us before you leave. It would be lovely just to, for you to introduce yourself. Those in line, thank you for gathering with us. The Lord bless you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you here again on Sunday morning here at Court Church at 11 o'clock. God bless you.